Following chapter two's messianic vision, chapter three was a chapter in which Yeshai spoke about the horrors that would come to the Jewish people for their lack of care for the widows and the orphans, about how all, how all the vanity would turn to uh, death and destruction. And we uh, read the first verse in chapter four yesterday, but we will repeat it again. So in that day, when all the destruction, all the women who had all of these jewels and adornments and beautiful silk scarves, etc., etc., and again, you could understand as being women, you can understand as being representative of the Jewish people. So it's written as women, but doesn't necessarily need to be understood that way today. Um, they're going to be so shamed that they're going to all they're going to grab hold of one man. And those who say because of these wars and destruction that so few of the men will come back from the battlefield is one way of explaining it. Uh, and they'll say to this man, we'll eat our own food, we'll wear our own clothes, and let us, oh, let us be called by your name. Take away our disgrace, whether that's about the, the Jewish people and God. We're back to you. We don't need all these other idols. We only want you is one way of understanding it. The other way, again, they are so desperate after a big, being so haughty, so arrogant, so vain, so much jewels and gold and silver and not caring about what is necessary in life, that they need to completely reverse their lives in order to um, bring back society to the way it should be. And therefore, they're willing to demean themselves, even if it means they're one of just seven wives. And on that day, continuing verse two, And in that day, the radiance of God will lend beauty and glory and splendor to the land. And there will be dignity and majesty to the survivors of Israel, right? So these these women who are representative, again, I don't think it's women, we could say representative of idolaters. Now all of a sudden they're leaving their idols behind. So now God can sprout the love of God, the uh, the um, the worship of God, and therefore morality and godliness. So those who understand that these words, litzvi ulechavod, these, uh, these people for beauty and for honors are referring to the righteous that the righteous uh, people who live upstanding moral lives, that they are, those Torah giants bring splendor and beauty and glory to God. Continuing in verse 3, And those who remain in Sion and are left in Yerushalayim, all those are inscribed for life in Yerushalayim shall be called holy. Right? If you've survived this, that means that you were one of the righteous people. The people who didn't survive the way that the Tanakh understands it are the people who uh, were uh, not worthy, who were idol worshippers, who were murderers and killers. And therefore, um, the other people are left in Jerusalem are understand as being those who are kadosh, those who are being holy. I should point out one thing, which is that, um, and this we pointed out uh, in the past, that, that right, um, Yishai is living at the time of the destruction of the northern kingdom the exile of the ten tribes that's a cataclysmic event up to this point in time there were always right the the cycle of the book of shoftim as we mentioned it back in uh, a few a few days ago a couple of weeks ago right there was always there was death there was destruction there were uh, attacks by enemies but israel went to god apologized said forgive us and god would send them a savior and things would start again, things would be okay for a while until the events repeated. That all ends during the lifetime of Yeshai, and not with the kingdom that he spends his most time with. He's from the he's, he's a, a member of the greater Davidic family, and so he's dealing with the Davidic kingdom, he's dealing with Yehuda, not the Malchut Yisrael, not the northern kingdom, but the northern kingdom has been destroyed, and many, many people have been killed, and they have been exiled. And later on in his time, during the days of Chizkiah, who towards the end of his life, we don't know this prophecy probably happens before that, right? Sanchera, the Assyrian king, as we read about, he destroys most of Judah. And he, and he lays siege to Jerusalem, and, and only due to Chizkiah's praying and God's intervention, a miracle happens, and Sanchera and his men, they run back to Assyria, and, and uh, their leader, Sanchera, the king, dies, and many of his officers die. Uh, uh, so... 
uh, here we're talking about a time where it's not just a simple regime change, but there is complete death and destruction in the Northern Kingdom and uh, disbursement. And there was also a lot of destruction of the kingdom of Yehuda. So those who remain, Yeshaya says, which in the past, it wasn't like this. It wasn't, you know, most people were exiled or most people were killed. This is a time period where that's, that's happening, unfortunately. And thus he has to speak about the remnant, only the, the Hanishar, the Hanotar, the ones who remain, the ones who are left. So with that background, uh, hopefully that explains a little bit more of what's going on here. Let's continue in verse four. Imrachatz Adonai Sot Bnei Soat Bnei Tzion Beit Mei Rishalayim Yadiach Mikirba Beruach Mishpat Uveruach Ba'er. When God washes away the filth, so as usually like a dung, uh, of the daughters of Zion and from Jerusalem's midst, has rinsed out her infamy in a spirit of judgment and in a spirit of purging. Right. So again, this is the death, the destruction, getting rid of the the evil, getting rid of the horrors, getting rid of the, the vanity. Then God will create over the whole shrine, all of the meeting places of Zion will be a cloud by day and smoke with the glowing flame and fire by night. It will be uh, indeed over all of the kavod over all of the glory shall hang a canopy. In this verse, it's impossible to read this verse and not to think of the Jews leaving Har Sinai where we had, right, we had Anan, we had a cloud during the day and we had Aish, Laila, here it says Ashan is a smoke and a glowing flame. There, there was Aish alone, here it says Aish as well. And the idea of enveloping B'nai Yisrael, this idea of a chupa, here a chupa just means a hanging canopy. Of course, we hear the word chupa or chupa, we think of a wedding, we think of a marriage, we think of, on a metaphorical level, the idea of God and the Jewish people uh, being wed Right, and that's in many ways what we celebrate in the upcoming holiday this very week, Shavuot, the covenant that is concluded, uh, that is made between God and the Jewish people, with the image, the idea of Har Sinai being held according to the midrash over the Jewish people and uh, and uh, the, the the witnesses, the uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this idea seems to be at least me coming back to an idea way back when, when the Jewish people escaped an earlier horror and we're united with, with God. And that's seemingly what we're, at least to me, what, where, what the prophet is uh, sort of allowing people to think back to what they've learned historically. And then, like I said, it's a short chapter. The sukkah tiye latzel yomam mechorev ule machste ule mistor miderem umatar. And this chupa, this canopy, will serve as a sukkah also, right? The protective covering uh, to provide shade from the heat during the day. And it will be a shelter at night from, from, um, from uh, rain, right? So here, if we think about it, we were talking about attacks from enemies, attacks from enemies, destruction, death, not so many men coming back from the battle, the 10 tribes being exiled. And here we see that God's protection now is going to be not just against others, but it's going to be also against the natural elements. It's going to be also against the, um, you know, the sun and the and the rain, um, and it's going to be a great protection for uh, for Bnei Yisrael. Just interestingly, the the Gemara, one of the sources that a sukkah ha- can only be. Um, can only be a certain height. It comes from this verse. Uh, the rabbis in Gemara Masechet Sukkah learn this because it says that, right, the sukkah has to be let's sail. It has to provide shade. And if it's very, very high, then the schach, which is the part that's sort of halachically, the sukkah is not providing the shade. The walls are providing the shade, right? You're sitting on the bottom. Imagine if your walls were 30 feet high. All the shade would come from the walls, not from the uh, not from the schach. So it says that your sukkah can't be more than, according to the Gemara, derives from this esrim uh, ama is is um, is one word that's long, uh, one, one law, again, it's not <laughs> anything to do with our verse, really, but we're saying, and there's a second law also that's derived in Masech at Sukkah, the idea of having three uh, walls, right, is, is also, is also, 
according to some, um, derived from this, uh, this Pasuk. So if you don't have three full walls, then it doesn't provide shelter or refuge. Halakhically, we say it doesn't have to be three full walls. It can just be two in a bit. But those who say, right, if you want to be protected from heat, from rain, from a storm, you better have at least three walls. If you have such an open sukkah with the right with a cross breeze and two walls or whatever it is, then it will not protect you. So the rabbis, looking at this verse, uh, they uh, they come up with um, different laws related to the halakot of sukkah. For us, what this chapter again is about is the destruction of the earlier chapter due to Bnei Yisrael's lack of proper care, lack of building of a just society due to their and their vanity rather than being concerned with core issues is going to result in some sort of cataclysmic event. And the few who are left will be righteous and thus they will be given and granted extra protection by God.